12 men a day or one man every two hours. So while we're here now, there'll probably be some man somewhere in the UK that takes their own life, sadly, um, which is all, an absolutely awful statistic. Um, so I'm under the age of 50, so statistically I'm more likely to die by my own hand than I am to die in a car accident or any any other way. Um, people say that men don't talk, but we find that they do if we give them an op- give them a space to talk openly and, and without any fear of any fear of judgment. Mm. Growing up in the nineties, it's sort of the the lad culture of you're not allowed to cry and that sort of thing. So my expectation in that moment was I'm going to get left. I'm going to get met with what you're crying for and laughter. And actually, the room was just absolutely silent. Um, somebody I'd never met put the hand on my shoulder and said it's alright just let it out it'll be alright yeah so this week um, it was a record week we had 3,079 men um, attend and about so a record week yeah and about 300 of those were, were new attendees Paul is ill so if he gives you the laggy yeah you got to excuse my voice today mate because um, yeah I've been uh, just phlegmy in coffee for the last four or five days but um finally made out of bed yesterday so hopefully i'll make it through this i'm sure you will yeah i'll be fine mate okay welcome back to the everyday perspective podcast please like and subscribe to the channel it really supports us today's guest is craig harrison craig how are you mate i'm very well mate thank you good thanks for coming on uh so craig you are a you are the lead facilitator uh for andy's man club in plymouth um, so Andy's Man Club is obviously a, a men's charity uh, to support with mental health and there's tons of amazing charities and we really good to, to get you in and, and have a chat with you about this one specifically um, some of the other episodes that we've done already have covered sort of mo- a multitude of, of different aspects of men's mental health and our purpose is really to support men with that but we take the approach of, of trying to provide information and level guys up um, we've also had a doctor on who was talking about maybe hormone deficiencies and that type of thing. So there's a, a number of ways that you can maybe approach this, but obviously men's mental health, it seems to be obviously a very individual journey. And I think that's where Andy's Man Club really plays a, an amazing role. Um, so it'd be great just from from yourself for you to, to, to explain what Andy's Man Club is, um, I guess obviously who Andy is, um, why the charities exist and, and what their purpose is. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so Andy's Man Club, um, to break it down to the simplest form, it's a talking group for men. Um, Andy's Man Club was set up back in 2016 um, following the death by suicide of a, of a lad called Andy Roberts, um, who was 23 um, at the time, showed no signs of struggling, had struggled a bit in his in his youth, um, seemed to be on a good path, and then suddenly one, one night went out and, and took his own life. Um, his family, with his, with his brother-in-law, Luke Ambler, who, who set up the charity, um, set it up to stop any family going through what they'd gone through um and that was back in 2016 and here we are seven years later um the the charity's original aim was to have i think 10 groups in in five years and and we're now 138 clubs uk wide so uh it's blown out of proportion but in a way that obviously it's much needed around the uk Mm, yeah definitely and i think you know with andy there i think that's the the sad truth for so many men isn't it where there's this, there's no sign, um, and then they just go and they do it. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about, I guess, the the actual work that the charity does. Then, so you mentioned it's a, it's a sort of a, a talking group. So, how how do you know sort of how how the session structured? Um, how does that all work? Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I said, we run 138, 132, I think, at the moment. There's a few clubs in the pipeline, which one of them I'll come on to in a, in a little while. Um, so every group runs Monday night, 7 till 9 p.m. Uh, the only time we don't meet is, is bank holidays because a lot of the venues are, are closed. Uh, however, groups still meet up on, a, on those bank holiday Mondays and go for a walk and, and have a chat with people. Um, guys can come along. Uh, there's no requirement to, to sign up to it or to sort of go on a waiting list or, or to even be referred to us. Um, the number of guys we've seen in Plymouth alone that have come to us at 10 to 7 on a Monday and said, I saw your Facebook post half an hour ago and thought I'd come down and, and see what it's all about. Um, the only requirements um, for attending is you, you're a man and aged 18 or over, um, which is obviously for, for things like safeguarding. Um, there's no actual requirement to be suffering with your mental health. Guys can come along for just broken up with a partner, bad day at work, because this should be a bad day at work, um, come along for any reason, get, get a cup of tea, cup of coffee, have a sit down and, and have a chat. Um, but also there's no requirement to 
talk until they're ready. Um, so even though it is aimed at talking and getting people to, to open up and, and talk about whatever they're going through, um, we've had guys come along for four or five weeks and not say a word, and that's absolutely not a problem. No, Nobody's going to sit there and go, right, you're here now, you've got to, you've got to talk. It's, it's at that person's pace. And sometimes it's four or five weeks, sometimes it's question two uh, uh, of the night that they start opening up. How many how many people are in a group? Uh, we have in Plymouth um, roughly about fifty guys attend a week. Which when we say that, people go, "Oh my god, it's fifty guys!" But we do sort of break that down into groups of around eight to twelve, uh, which will include two or three facilitators in that group. Um, I mean, some groups have groups of twenty. Um, we found in Plymouth particularly that a group of twelve is about the about the right size. Um, one of our guys sort of broke it down and said if you have 12 guys in a room for two hours that's each guy's got 10 minutes to answer those and that's not having a break so yeah. when we fall out it's like actually that isn't a lot of time so i i'm always cautious that i'd rather us if we can host more groups then so be it i'd rather a group finish at 20 to 9 and have a bit of time at the end to have a chat rather than five to nine we we finish in a group because basically we've got to leave the college yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and do you know how many, any, how many sort of attendees or members you have in the sort of nationwide? Yeah, so this week, um, it was a record week. We had 3,079 men um, attend. And about so a record week. Yeah, and about 300 of those were, were new attendees. Mm -hmm. um, so the only thing we have to do as facilitators um, at the end of the night, we don't have to give any details back to head office. Um, it's just basically how many men attended and how many were new. Yeah. So they can sort of keep a track on trends. So. If we suddenly go in Plymouth from 45 guys to then suddenly 100 guys, it's like, do we need to look at a, another venue or do we need to speak to the college about more rooms and stuff? So it's more just for trends to make sure that we're not stretching uh, the groups too thin. Yeah, and, and and this probably, I guess, will change city to city depending on what yeah. facilities you have available. But I'm just mindful that one of the things that a previous guest, um, Dr. Angela Service, talked about was some guys when they when they start suffering depression and specifically if it's maybe more in our field where it's hormone deficiently related they, they they become quite sort of socially isolated um, and withdrawn and the idea of a guy potentially walking into a group of, of sort of 50 guys is probably really intimidating yeah. uh, maybe even 10 guys is intimidating so can you talk us through if you're a new guy and you've seen your post and you turn up to a venue like you know how the group's sort of dispersed and broken down what's the what's that greeting like how do you welcome new people yeah well, we do say you know? for every guy that comes along the first impression is not when they walk in and it's it's at the front door so we want to make sure that's welcoming so we'll always have a guy outside or a couple of guys outside at the front door wearing Andy's Man Club t-shirts um, or hoodies so we have guys you see them walk along and then see us and turn around and, and get in the so it's sort of managing that not sort of going up to them and going, are you here for, but we do have to sometimes say like, are you here for Andy's man club? It's perfectly fine. Um, get them at the door, we're there available if they have any questions or if they're nervous. We will often say that the biggest step for them is that first night walking through the door the first time um, because they got maybe no understanding of where the group runs and they don't know how many people are going to be there. Um, once they're there, we sort of set any nerves, show them where to go and get them a tea or coffee. Um, and just be really a friendly face at the door. Um, explain that there's no expectation for them to talk if they don't want to. And, and sort of, we do go over the rules in the group when we start the group, but we should have give them a little bit of a breakdown of how it's going to work. Um, and then one of the facilitators is normally myself. Um, at about 10 to 7, we start to allocate people to rooms. So try and keep the room sort of even even numbers, uh, but also not put... So if, we, if I notice we've got four or five new guys not to try to put all four or five in the in the same group um to sort of even that out just because then it's it's the best experience for them um sometimes two or three in the same group ends up being and, and, it, and that works fine but it's quite daunting if you've got four or five new guys and as a facilitator when you pass the ball on you i try to sort of if i can see there's a new guy to my left and an experienced guy to my right i'll pass it to the i won't just thrust it onto the new guy and say right here's your question crack on because it's that could be quite intimidating um Whereas if you've got two new guys either side, it's kind of, well, I've got to give it to one of them. So just try to make it as, as best we can, in, in particularly in the Plymouth group. You were just um, you just mentioned rules. Yeah. What 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 rules are, are in um, So as part of the rules of the group, um, f no phones or sort of phones on silent or, or, or off. 
um, just for the respect of the group really we don't really want someone to be going into some deep share and then someone's ringtone goes off um, What when the ball goes around the room while well, you've got the ball in your hands that's your time to talk um, we try not to sort of try for it not to become sort of a back and forth between three or four different people um, especially if someone's talking about something quite traumatic from their sort of maybe childhood um, the only f- topics we don't talk about um, medication is one just because as facilitators we're, we're peer-to-peer support we're not trained to, to talk in that area even if we have a facilitator that may be trained in that respect when they're in the when they're in the club that they're not in that role they're sort of yeah. a, as a facilitator and politics and religion we stay clear of those two um because two errors would go pretty quickly if we started going into that rabbit hole um and really whatever's said in the group stays in the group so again we we just took just mentioned numbers at the end of the night we don't report back on anything anyone has said or unless someone says something that as facilitators we feel that person is a is in a danger to themselves or someone else and, and obviously we then have safeguarding processes to follow um but generally whatever said there stays there um and it's just really about giving everyone the time they need to talk um i'll often say that as much as it is letting people talk there obviously are occasions where you have to sort of steer the conversation back and and not let it go too yeah, off the topic. Too bad, yeah. um and i'll say that at the start like we're not if we have to cut you off it's not that we don't appreciate what you're saying but we obviously have to give everyone the, the same amount of time and, 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 and the same opportunity um, as facilitators as well. So we'll start the night off with, with the rules and we'll, we'll come to question one. Um, we'll ask the question, but then we also answer it as well. So it's not, so we also, as much as we run the group, first and foremost, we're, we're still users of the group as well. So we still have stuff we have to get off our chest every week. Um, and that I think settles any nerves because they can see that we, even though we've got a t-shirt on, we're part of the group as well yeah yeah that's good and can you t- sort of explain how you f- actually facilitate the conversations is there like a sort of a series of questions that you asked and like you know you'd mentioned the ball a couple of occasions it's sat on a table so what role does that play yeah so we start off um the ball is sort of the talking stick sort of thing that they put that that's their time and the number of balls i've got that have got bits missed missing out of them and people are talking and they're picking the ball um some guys will sit and and won't make eye contact with anyone, but they'll sort of talk talk to the ball. Um, ball goes around the room, five questions every week. Um, and the, the good thing about Andy's Man Club as well is that the five questions we have in Plymouth will be the same five questions in Newton Abbott, Manchester, Bristol, Newcastle. So if someone is visiting family, say up in Newcastle one week, and they go along to that club, they'll know the format will be exactly the same as, as their usual club. Um, first three questions stay the same every week so it's always a bit of an introduction and how's your week been um, such a simple question but and some guys can say yeah I've had a good week I've had a bad week my week's been indifferent um, second question even if they've had the worst week possible we try to get them to find a positive from the week and then third question which is generally the one that's the most time consuming of the night is anything they want to talk about or get off the chest um, and that's where people go into sort of history and, and sort of might go into more detail and somebody, some guys might say actually I had nothing to get off my chest this week until somebody cut me up at Manadon Roundabout on the way here and that's really annoyed me And um, but there's no sort of we like to say it's not top trumps there's no my problem is worse than your problem it's it's whatever that person is, is going through then we have a bit of a break and then the last two questions uh, they change every week so they're a bit more light hearted and positive uh, so this week we had if you could be friends with any TV or movie character, who would it be and why? And then next week's might be what are you going to do for yourself or someone else this week to improve their well-being? And Christmas time, we always get, what's your favourite Christmas movie? Which then starts the debate of, of Die Hard. And that normally gets, <laughs> there's, there's no fucking debate yeah. there, is there? Surely. Well, no. Is it even a Christmas movie? That's, yeah, that's it is. The yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Come on. Uh, so so that, that opens up that debate. But yeah, so we, we have those questions and they, they change the last two they're normally a bit more quick fire and, and light hearted and they end the night on a bit more of a positive note. Um, the number of weeks we've had guys question three are in tears and then by the end of question five, they're laughing and joking with the rest of the group. It it sort of picks the mood up a little bit. Mm, yeah. And I guess this might come down to maybe sort of training that that, that you get as, as part of being a facilitator. Um, but I imagine sort of facilitating these groups, there, there's going to be some quite harrowing things coming out and... Um, 
you know, people that are really kind of in a bad place. I keep saying people, but men that are in a really bad place. Um, do you do you, what what training do facilitators receive? Do you do you receive training around sort of I don't know um, like suicide first aid, um, like sort of understanding when and where to refer and that type of thing? Yeah, so we get um, training when we become new facilitators from from head office, which is obviously was previously done um, locally, sort of face to face. Then had to go online with with COVID. It stayed online now because they can reach more people um, in that way. But mainly the the most thing that we get is we've got our own experience our own experience of of, of life and, and our own problems so there might be so which i'll come on to my story in a second but there might be someone there that has a problem that's similar to what i went through and that i can empathize with that um the main training we get is around sort of spotting if someone is is going to be a sort of a is, is potentially a danger to themselves and then as a as a last resort we'd we'd sort of phone the services and, and police if that was the case and um, touch wood so far in four years in plymouth we've never had to uh never had to do that um and we get refresher training each year so and the training is mainly around how to run the group so it's basically from start of the night to the end of the night this is this is how the group should run um and as it's just experience each week i mean i'm um, four years in now and and there's always stuff that i'm picking up on and something that i haven't seen in in four years but it's really just having that experience of and got guys will say it to us they'll say oh i've been to psych psychiatrists and counselors and and you're the first person that's got what i'm going through because you went through it two years ago and it's just having that lived experience yeah and and do you uh, sort of is is advice uh, built into those sessions or is it really just again peer to peer and yeah we tr we try to steer clear of of advice as such it's more sort of coping strategies and like i somebody will come to us we say um money problems and someone will say well i went through that and i, I went to these i looked at these guys and these guys and, and maybe we should give those a try um and what we don't i think the whole medication side the whole not discussing medication come about because a few years ago, somebody mentioned in, somebody was in a group and they said, "Oh, I've stopped my medication. I think you should do that." And then that person did stop and 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 took a sort of relapse. So it's around sort of not really giving them advice and you should do this. It's have you tried this and yeah. maybe this would work for you. And sometimes it doesn't, um, but it's sort of giving everyone as many as many avenues to support as we can. So the advice that you give them, is there any specific advice? Is it, you know, do you encourage them to go to the gym? Do you encourage them any health checks, anything like that? Do you do, you do any of that? Or do you work with any other partners to kind of facilitate Yeah, that? we'll sort of signpost to, to sort of support where we where we sort of feel it's necessary. Um, one, of our, one of our facilitators does um, quite often mention to guys around, he's got a, a philosophy around his four corners. So he he notices he's in a better place mentally when he's got his diet exercise sleep and mindfulness in place if he misses any of those four areas then he notices that's probably why he's not having a very good day um so we sort of do suggest that to people um but i think it got, it does come down to sort of an individual individual basis um and they'll sort of bring stuff up and, and we'll sort of signpost where we can if we if we've got experience in that area yeah and do you provide any supporting literature to to the to the guys that come in are there like handouts or books or information that you provide yeah as well? we'll have so we if we liaise with other, other organizations we did recently at armed forces day um so we'll sort of get literature from other other organizations in the city and we'll have that out at group um so if people then um want to sort of take that away with them or take a picture of it they're, they're free to do so uh, but we sort of try not we leave it up to them to sort of make that decision rather than say the saying right you put in a leaflet in the face and say right you need to you need to do this it's like we'll give you that op we'll give you that option but ultimately you 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 will leave it to you to make that decision yeah that's crazy isn't it yeah. yeah and the the actual sessions i mean you talked obviously about them coming into a, a venue and and sitting down in a classroom is that always the way that the sessions go or do you ever get out and do activities and, and that type of thing uh, we do activities some of the guys will do activities outside of the monday nights but the monday nights is that is that format um Obviously, when we have like bank holidays, we'll go out and we'll have a walk down the Barbican and get some food and, and walk up to the house. So we do try and get out. And some of the guys have made good friendships, friendship groups themselves, and they'll go out up to Dartmoor in the week and, and do that. But generally, the, the sort of it's mainly for new guys coming along. We want to make sure that seven to nine on Mondays is the same format. Yeah. Um, what we don't want to do is they come along on week one, it's that format, and then week two, it's something different, which they're not expecting. So 
So sort of making sure it's quite it's it's the same for everybody. Yeah, great. And and what as as a facilitator, what challenges have you found? Because I, I've worked with with sort of groups more in sort of exercise rehabilitation, but sometimes in sort of chronic sort of pain conditions. And you find when when you've got a group, you know, you've got as you say people that don't say much, yeah. and then you've got sort of contributors who who are kind of really like sort of positive in their messaging and will support others. And sometimes naturally, especially with this type of thing, you're going to get some men that are obviously quite negative. Um, how do you kind of handle that dynamic? Um, it's, it's difficult, um, but we do sort of at the start, say at the start of the night, we sort of make it, we sort of make it aware that whatever people want to talk about, there's no, no judgments. If someone is negative or someone is positive, that's, that's, that's perfectly, perfectly fine for them. Uh, what we do sometimes have is guys will come along and they'll, they'll listen to two or three people talk and then they'll say, I've had a really good week and now I, I feel bad that I've had a good week. So no, don't, feel bad that you've had like celebrate the good weeks because in three weeks time you might be sat there and you might have had a really bad week so it's remembering that yeah. three weeks ago you had a you were a really good week so um and also for guys who come along and if, if they are in a negative mind space just seeing someone say that like six weeks ago i was exactly the same position you were i was rock bottom and and now i've come along to this and i know it's not an overnight fix but i'm in a much better place and and I can. It's also something that guys don't have to come along to every single week if they if they're not able to. So it's not a sort of a you've got to attend for twelve weeks in a row or, or that sort of thing. So um, we appreciate the. I mean, the facilitators are the same. They they have things going on and and life and work and stuff. So it's sort of making being aware that that is there when they when they do need it. Hi gents, just interrupting the episode to tell you about our sponsor Eden Clinic for Men. You might remember episode 13 when we had Dr. Angela Service on talking about male testosterone deficiency. Um, this is potentially linked to things like low mood, um, low energy, obesity, low libido. So there's a number of different things that this could have an impact on. So if this applies to you, your mates, your dad, your brother, or even if it doesn't and you want to get a baseline number of where your testosterone levels are at, then check out the link below and get yourself a well-man check booked in and they do a full blood test, which will also include your hormones, so your testosterone, but also diabetes check as well, so your HbA1c, uh, your lipid profile, which is cholesterol, triglycerides, so the fats in your blood, um, kidney function, liver function, so pretty much everything you need to check to maintain your quality of health so check out the link below get yourself checked out and stay in tip-top health the, the amazing thing with andy's man club is you've already touched on this already but all the facilitators have obviously been through their own journey yeah. as well and yeah. obviously men's mental health and you know sort of depression anxiety low mood is, is very personal journey um so can you talk us talk us through how you I guess how you found Andy's Man Club and, and when you were in that position. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so as people can probably tell from the accent, I'm not from Plymouth originally, um, originally Midlands born and bred. Um, so I probably suffered with sort of levels of low mood and, and depression most of my sort of adult life. Um, didn't really have the tools then to deal with it, mostly work stress and things like that. So um, five years ago, it seems weird, really weird to say it's five years ago because it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, was in a position where I was living in Birmingham with my ex-wife at the time. Um, she was from Plymouth originally. We got married down here, um, but we lived in Birmingham. So she was quite keen to, the next step of our life is to move back to Plymouth and, and sort of have a family and, and, and do that. Um, so I sent out my CV to all, I was in a school at the time, working in a school. So I sent out my CV to all the schools in Plymouth, got offered an interview for a job down here and, and got the job and, and right, that's the next plan. We'll move to Plymouth and we got a, we, lined up a house to buy so uh, I moved him with her mom and dad for a little while and and while I was while I started work and then as we came to move down to Plymouth and a, f a few weeks before we'd, we'd sort of having a bit of a not great time to, together and obviously when I was going back up to Birmingham and then the sort of decision was made um, that we wouldn't be together anymore so I'd moved down to Plymouth started a new job and getting ready to start a new life and and then so that bombshell over the summer um, so then still had to come back and, and live with her mum and dad for a little while, which was her mom a wonderful, and dad. Yeah, oh, a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, they, they were, they were great. They were, yeah. they were more than supportive. They, they were sort of stuck in the middle of, right, he's living with us, but obviously it's our daughter. So, um, I've got nothing, nothing sort of negative, um, towards them. Um, love was a good place with my job. So that was the only thing really keeping me, keeping me down here. 
Um, if that wasn't the case, I probably would have just packed the car up in that summer and, and gone back to Birmingham and, and passed her on the way up the motorway. Um, so then had to move out into my own place, which which was a big, big change because most of my adult life I'd lived either at home or then with her. So it was kind of a doing bills and stuff, which I'd never, never really had to do. Um, suffered and sort of struggled and, and didn't really see a way um, forward that all the support network I had in Plymouth was linked to her, her friends, her family. So all my support network was, was, was back home. Um, as great as they were, they weren't obviously here and, and, I was trying to sort of put on a, a brave face and going to work and being all happy and smiley at work. And the minute I walked, went out of work, was I'd become myself and 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 suffering. So I saw that Andy's Man Club um, at the time, the only group in Devon was the one in Newton Abbott. Um, so I saw, happened to see one day that they were opening their club in Newton Abbott that that evening. Uh, I remember sitting in 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 work and it was a training day and hoping and praying that no one would walk in the office because I was in tears and. I was not in a not in a good way mentally, um, so drove up to Newton Abbott. Don't really remember driving up there. Don't really remember driving back. Remember, remember the group, and um, found found the location for the club and, and walked in. Was met by a chap who now he's one of my really close friends, Chris from from Newton Abbott. Um, he said, "Oh, you're here for Andy's Man Club." I was like, "Yeah." And that was it. Walked in, um, and that was again back to the door, sort of meeting meeting at the door. Um, sat down didn't know what to expect sat in a room with with 25 other guys and as the ball was coming round to the to me um people were obviously talking about how their week was and i was like oh, for God, oh I, I can't do this and ball landed in my hands and i think i managed to get four words out which was yesterday my marriage ended and just burst into tears that was that was my answer to question one um and the room went silent and growing up in the 90s it's sort of the the lad culture of you're not allowed to cry and that sort of thing. So my expectation in that moment was I'm gonna get left I'm gonna get met with what you're crying for and laughter and actually the room was just absolutely silent. Um somebody I'd never met put their hand on my shoulder and said, It's all right, just let it out, it'll be all right. Um and that was that was that night. Um continued to go back to Newton Abbott and got myself in a in a position where maybe I wasn't hundred percent but I was in a in a better place and started to support that group and then was asked you drive into Newton Abbott every week. If if there's a way we can get a group set up in Plymouth, is that something you would you'd be interested in running? And I was like, yeah, abso- absolutely, I'd I'd do that. And then here we are, four years later. Can you can you talk us through some of the emotions that you kind of were were experiencing at those various points of that story? So I guess you know at that point when you're in work and you're kind of you're teary, like where where was your head at at that point? I was just completely completely all over the place. Um, I didn't know what. The next hour was going to look like at that time. Um, a couple of occasions, I vividly remember driving back home for the weekend to see to see my family, and I drove over the bridge at Bristol, and the thought would go through my mind: would what would happen if I just turned the wheel now? Like my my suffering would 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 end, and and I wouldn't be in in pain anymore. Not thinking that obviously that pain would then be passed on to my family and and friends that that would. Um, Thankfully, I didn't um, act on that, but those thoughts were were there, um, and I was continuing to go to work every day. And say, we we sort of refer to it as putting a mask on. So I was going to work every day and putting a mask on of being helpful and, and supporting people and and doing my job. And then I'd get home, and then the reality of everything would hit me then, and and I'd I'd find myself at home just sitting in in tears watching telly, and um, I was in a way living too two lives my sort of home life was awful but I was having to I was having to make out that everything was fine while I was at while I was at work since then obviously people at work have, have known that's where I was at that time but at the time I was very careful to sort of not not deem to show any weakness and which is ridiculous looking back on it but at the yeah. time that's where my mind was and, and, and why why did you feel you were in a position where you couldn't share with your colleagues and, and the workplace what you were experiencing and I think it was and we, we sort of talk about this quite a lot that it was sort of the the feeling embarrassed that that this shouldn't be the way I am I should be I'm a man I should be strong and I should be dealing with everyone else's problems I didn't talk about it with with people at home because my mindset was well they got their own problems they don't want to be dealing with my problems as well I didn't want to burden them with my with my issues um which again looking back is like I, I should have been more open um 
But I do think that if I hadn't seen that Andy's Man Club post and I hadn't attended that first night, because the easy, easy thing would have been to see it and then go, actually, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to that. But my determination was, I will go along and see what it's all about. Um, I do genuinely think I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, wasn't for that. Do you think it was the isolation of being down in Plymouth and then obviously the split? Do you think it would have been as bad if you had been at home with family? No, I don't think. Talk? I don't think it would have been as bad if I had been based back up in the Midlands, uh, or if we if we were there and and we weren't moving down to Plymouth. I think that definitely was a factor. Um, I mean, I met up with a couple of her friends who were sort of quite conscious that I wasn't in a good place, um, but I didn't feel like. I think at the time it was like if I if I really let them know how I'm feeling they're going to go and tell her and it's going to get back to her. And um, I mean, I got no, as much as the time I had ill will towards her, now I'm, I've, I've not got anything towards her at all. It's sort of a... Why, I, why is that though? I think it's just the journey I've gone on. So the easy thing for me to do would be five years later to still be bitter and still be sort of a hater. And this was actually, she was going through her problems at the time I was having for my problems it wasn't meant to be but actually now I want her to be to be happy um somebody asked me a while back about it, not what it was probably about a year after we'd split and they said oh do you still do you still love her and stuff and I said I'm not in love but I will always have love for her because we were together for seven years I'll always have that feelings towards her but ultimately now I want her to be happy like I'm sure she wants me to be happy so it's just that it's just that growth of sort of the easiest, easy thing would be to stay angry at her for five, but it's not. It's not going to do me any good. It's not going to do me any positive work of being angry for five years. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. that that, yeah. that self accountability is really important. I think for for positive mental health, isn't it? Um, and and Craig, when you when you got through those doors, so you you were greeted at the door by by one of the facilitators. You went into that room for the first time, which was full of guys. What's what was the atmosphere like, and, and how were you feeling? Like, is there music playing? Like, was it quiet? Were people talking? No, it was quite. It was quite quiet um, at the time. The Newton Abbott Club was ran. Um, one of the guys who had become a facilitator. It was his his restaurant. Yeah. So he said to the to the club, like, I I don't open on a Monday, so you're more than welcome to come and use my use my restaurant. Um, and his his plan was to sort of just be there to open the doors and lock up at the end of the night. And he sat in the corner and then over weeks he'd become more involved and, and eventually became a facilitator himself because he was he was blown away by the sort of stuff people were talking about. Um, he often says that he didn't sleep for two days because of my story. He was convinced that I wouldn't be at that club. I wouldn't be alive the next week because of where I was mentally. He said he'd never seen anyone as, as sort of low mentally as I was. He said it was great. When I walked through the door that following week, he he was immediately like, oh, put it rest, put it, his mind was put at rest that I, w- I was still there, um, and we're really good friends now. And and um, I, they say that I say that I wouldn't be there without them, but they say no, actually, no, it's we just gave you a space to talk, um, which we still do now. So um, people say that men don't talk, but we find that they do if we give them an up, give them a space to talk openly and and without any fear of any fear of judgment mm, yeah 100 percent. and the other thing i wanted to ask is you, you mentioned about obviously when you had uh, that sort of breakdown in tears when you were in your first session we had uh, mark hornrod on who's um, yeah. obviously a triple amputee um and he talked about a, a point where he was at his lowest and and basically just had a he called it a purge and he said it's great to have a purge and yeah. then you come out the other side of that and you, you feel a little bit different what what did that feel like in in the moments i guess after um and then maybe waking up the next day yeah, it was it was a massive physical. It was like a release of everything that had been going on probably for two or three months, um, and just releasing it all in one in one go. Um, we still find that now, like guys will say to us, they've come week one and they'll come back the following week and they'll say, "I felt absolutely drained last Tuesday morning when I woke up." I said, "Well, that's because you've been keeping all this in for so long, and even if you only open the jar a little bit, you've sort of." still had a massive physical exertion of, of getting all that out and, and letting it go. Um, so yeah, it was just the same. It was, I don't say, I don't remember driving back from Newton Abbott. I, I sort of remember bits of driving up there and trying to find where it was, but the drive back was just blank. I just managed to get back home and, and um, I think it was just sort of, sort of, sort of such an adrenaline run rush from, from being there that first night. Yeah. 
Yes, deeper. Yes, fucking. You know, it's, it's it's not a lot you can say because it's it, it's everyone's individual journey and and what they go through. You know, people would you look at Mark's what he went through, what you went through, and you can always look at different points of people's lives and how they're feeling, but you can never understand how someone's feeling at times. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it's it's really hard to. You know, I've had friends even recently that have gone through loads of shit with their partners and stuff like that, and I've. I'm always there for them and I always give them advice. But if you're not experiencing that in yourself, it's very hard, isn't it? And you always should go and talk about it and get it off your chest and, and those types of things. And that's but, why we sort of say to guys that... It's like no judgment. Yeah. Your your problem might be a four, but to you it's a 10. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a comparison. And some guys will, will say, oh, I don't feel my problem's as bad as... It's like, no, actually, it's... If your problem's affecting you in that way, then it's it's important... There's no, there's no sort of comparison. Everyone is equal, um, whether they're a, someone who doesn't work, whether they're a CEO of a company. When they walk through the door of an Andy's Man Club, everyone is, is equal. And I think the big thing as well with men, like you said before, we don't want to talk about things. We want to we wanna act as if we're the fucking hardest in the room. We want to not talk. We, you, we don't want to look weak. But then at times, the other side of it is that everyone, at times, your family depends on you. All those other avenues of life that, you know, everyone kind of depends on you. It is, it is really good to have an outlet where you can actually go there and talk and just be open about shit. Do you know what I mean? Without any judgment. Because let's be honest, if I, if probably most of us in our room, if we said how we felt at times to our families, they'd think you was a fucking, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They think, oh, fuck, you know, yeah. what? You know, and it's and it's and it is that. Isn't it? But this is where this is why I really think you guys do some amazing work because I'm exactly the same. I'm I'm fucking terribly stoic at times. And just won't show weakness, especially to my other half. And, you know, my, my mum and dad, 100% not, you know what I mean? And But I will probably come and have a chat with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm pissed off about something, you know, and it, it's always quite powerful when you speak to somebody and you're like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean, mate. I felt like that yesterday or last week. Um, so I think that's, you know, sort of men talking to men, I think is, is, is yeah, great. I think it's really good. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the crying thing, that's something that I've always struggled with yeah. massively. What? I mean, like crying in front of people. Oh yeah. I've, like I, you know, I've, 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 I wet eyes on plenty of occasions, but I'm like ducking for cover. <laughs> if I even get a fucking drop, yeah. you know, watching a film, at a funeral, like I, I, I really struggle. And to me, it almost feels like it's the equivalent of being stood in, the, in, in a busy street, stripping naked. Like it, you feel that exposed when I think about crying in front of somebody. So it, I feel like it must be so liberating once you've been through that and gone, actually. It's, yeah, it's, I'll just, it's I, I can't remember the last time I cried. Mm. Yeah, you're you're dead like inside. That. I am dead inside. <laughs> it's, like, it's an emotion just the same as laughing. Yeah. yeah. It's, just, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting, getting men to understand that it's perfectly as, no, as normal as laughing with someone. It's, quite, it's, a, it's an emotion. It's, it, it's not good to keep that in and, and sort of... Um, Is there another side to that, though? Is there... Like you said a minute ago, we're opening the can. Yeah. Does it go the other way? Is there is there another side to it where you can open up too much and then it releases all these emotions and then they, people get worse from that? Is it, have you ever seen that sort of side of stuff? Um, it can, um, but I'm not it, saying it's to no, discourage no, people no. to talk. You should definitely talk, but I mean, you know, it's it's one of those where some people it might be so much of an emotion to talk about it or such a traumatic event that's happened that they kind of buried away a little yeah, bit that, and then it comes out and well, then it's well, like, the fear fuck. the fear of that might be the barrier for some mm. people talking so it's yeah, a good that point. Can, I mean that can happen and, and we just have to have to manage that. Um some guys will say, look, oh, I wasn't gonna I I I wasn't gonna talk about this tonight, but now that someone else has talked about something similar that I feel that I can I can open up and um it's just basically managing that. I mean if if somebody in the room does if it's too much for them, the role of the facilitators as well is that they can step outside with them and, and make sure they're okay and take them out of that room um, and sort of have a, not a want to, we sort of get a couple of facilitators from different rooms to, to come out and make sure they're okay um, rather than sort of letting them go off on their own and because and, we don't know where their mindset is at that time. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. It's such, it's such like, a, it's like a rabbit hole, isn't it? Of just, no one's the same, everyone's different, it's all different journeys, but we all, I think we all kind of need help in one way or another. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask, and again, this is, is probably sort of relevant to your personal journey, but maybe some of your colleagues that facilitate as well. And I guess to, to offer like an analogy into, I don't know, exercise rehabilitation, which is an area that I ex, uh, sort of have, have, have expertise in. So sports massage. So that provides like short-term, um, like short-term relief to an underlying problem. Um, so someone comes in, they're in pain physically, give them a massage they're sorted for a few days a few days time the underlying issue 
becomes pronounced again yeah. and they, they're back in pain and it's like this vicious cycle. So I find that for a lot of, a lot of men, that would be the same, but mentally. Um, and I guess, obviously you were in a bit of a, a spot and you, you had this kind of relief you know, to, for one of a better term, the massage yeah. um, within this group and being able to purge and everything else. But this may be still a bit of work to do in regard to sort of fixing the root problem. And this is going to be massively different for different people and different men. Um, so I guess, yeah, is, is there any work like there? And I, I guess my question to you is, is then becoming a facilitator, did that purpose of doing that, did that then sort of I don't know, put you in a different headspace where you had a bit of purpose and you were supporting other men. Did that help you like mentally and emotionally yeah, as well? Yeah, it did. Um, Cause then it was my way to give back. Um, and I would say I'm, I'm, I'm still, I wouldn't say I'm ever a hundred percent, but now I'm at the point where rather than having a bad week or a bad day, I might have a bad couple of hours. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm, I've got the tools now in my mind that it's made me a lot better at talking to my new partner. Um, and I do sometimes think like, if I'd had this five years ago, would things have been different? I'll, I'll never know that, uh, but would things have been different if I'd had this ability to to open up more? Uh, I mean, there are still things that I'll talk about at club that I won't talk to her about, um, but there's still there's stuff that I'll talk to her about that I won't talk about at club. So it's it's having that having that ability to to sort of split those down. Um, but now she she also will notice where I'm maybe not myself, even if I don't notice it. Um, because she's seen the su the support that I get from Andy's Man Club and the, and the purpose I've got from that. Um, even so, we had a we had a baby recently, um, and I obviously had to miss a couple of weeks due to that, which was obviously a, a pretty good reason to miss miss club. Um, even though I was I was sort of determined to try and get around it, and I think it was the first club I'd missed in I think eighteen months for not being a bank holiday. The first club I'd actually missed myself in in eighteen months, and and I did real I did notice the difference when I went back the following week. Of missing one week of from my own choice was was how much I'd actually missed it and not had that. Some of the guys will talk about it and they'll say it's like a weekly MOT. So what well, you you actually found a change in your what you, your actual mood? No, I just I just felt that I'd not had I I, re, I realised I'd missed obviously with a lot going on with baby. Yeah, I'd maybe needed that to go to club and talk about it, um, and I realised that I had it was affecting me that I hadn't gone. Not not mass not a sort of a not enough that uh, it sort of put me back in that position. But no, yeah, I noticed I've not had that ability to go and talk. Um, and there was something that sort of a there was a few things obviously with, with baby being in the hospital that I was able to chat to the guys in the week and sort of message them and stuff. But it didn't. It wasn't the same as as being in the group and having that having that ability to to answer those questions. Mm. Yeah, something we talk about a lot, isn't it? Is is that purpose? I think for men and community, we, we reference Brazilian Jiu Jitsu like loads. People probably get sick of hearing it to be honest, yeah. but, but you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit of, it's, it's difficult, which I think is good. Um, but you know, you're around a lot of other men. They're all like-minded. You're going through sort of shared struggles and obviously maybe in, in sort of Andy's man club groups, it's, it's obviously mental struggles, Jiu Jitsu is physical, but it's still a shared struggle. And I find that that really creates camaraderie and, and really strong bonds. So I guess it's probably the same in, in the sessions as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so some of the guys will meet up outside. Um, and there are guys now that I never met for Andy, would never have met for Andy's Man Club, um, would have probably passed him in the street and, and would have not batted an eyelid. And they're now some of the guys that I would I would think of as my, my closest friends. Um, a girlfriend... Is, is sort of quite regularly dropping the uh, <laughs> marriage hint into me quite regularly uh, now with a new baby. And obviously I'm conscious that I've, not that I wouldn't want to get married again, but obviously I've done that in the past. But if I was to get married again, there's guys at the club that I would invite to the wedding before probably some members of my family. <laughs> it's, it's it's the way that works that I'm, I would I would rather they be there because um, they've seen where I was five years ago to where I am, to where I am now. Um, and I, and I like to say that, and I say this as part of our presentation, that Andy's Man Club um, save lo saves lives. But for me also, I wouldn't have had my little boy without Andy's Man Club because I wouldn't have been here to have him now five years later. Hmm. How was, because um, we're, we're both dads um, and we, we were literally talking today offline about how, how that can really change your perspective. Like how for you has, has becoming a dad, I mean, very recently, change your outlook on your on your own sort of um, value I guess 
Yeah, um, it has massively because now I'm in a position where things that would normally really irritate me, it's like, actually, is it is it really worth getting that work to buy it? Um, obviously, I work in quite a high high stress job in in schools, um, and now it's like right four o'clock. I'm out the door. I'm getting home to my to my little boy. Uh, I've now got three weeks as we record. I've now got three weeks off, um, which the girlfriend is absolutely delighted about because it's my after two weeks of paternity leave back and forth to the hospital every day, she's like, well, you can redo, redo your paternity leave <laughs> now and you can, uh, I can have a lie in every morning. But yeah, it just changes my perspective actually. And it's something that I, it's really weird because I, I, I do life, I, I have a life coaching meeting as well as Andy's Man Club. So again, there'll be things I talk about with her that I don't talk about it with the girlfriend and, and with club. Um, a lot of the things that if stuff around club is frustrating me, I'll talk to her about it. Um, and sort of get a fresh perspective and she often says to me when you are feeling quite worked up with something what would you if the, if this was someone in club saying the same thing to you what would you say to them yeah. so use that use that perspective and something I've, I've I saw a few years back and it's a quote that um, just stay with me for a guy called Jay Shetty and it was if it's not going to matter in five years don't spend more than five minutes being upset by it it's like the small things that can get you really worked up at the time ultimately aren't going to matter in, in even six months' time, not even five years' time. I was about to say, yeah, fucking five minutes' time, mate, sometimes, yeah. isn't it? You know, the next day, yeah. good sleep. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what I always think. Yeah, it's so easy to catastrophize, though, isn't it? People do it all the bloody yeah. time. Um, and this is, this is maybe a little bit early to ask, but probably something you've thought about already. And again, something I'm sure we, we think about. Um, and I guess thinking about maybe sort of the stuff you hear from men in the room, thinking about your own sort of upbringing. As a parent now, to a boy, to a, to a future man, what do you think is really important like for them to experience as, as they grow old to make sure they're, I guess, in the best possible position mentally? I think for me, it was, and I don't think I ever, I wouldn't say I went through my, my, my young life without any form, of, any form of adversity. I mean, my parents divorced when I was eight, eight, nine, so was a massive thing for me growing up I think it's it's not exposing him to to sort of things that are gonna impact him but not being overprotective with him so he's got to sort of have he's got to build up that resiliency um as he grows up um and I I wouldn't ever sort of and I don't think I would have ever but I definitely won't now be sort of the, the sort of parent that's like don't cry don't show it like if you need to cry about something then that's that's perfectly fine um and it's sort of making making sure that he grows up in an environment where he has that ability to come to me about anything that he wants to um and, and use that experience of andy's man club um luke who set the charity up his his little boy um who was a big big part of why they why they set the charity up um he said a while back that he would he, when he when he grows up he'd love to work for andy's man club and then he about a couple of days later he said, actually, Dad, my when I said I wanted to work for Andy's Man Club, I don't want to work for Andy's Man Club. And he's like, oh, okay. He says because I don't want there to be an Andy's Man Club when I'm when I'm older. I want and and that's part of our aim is that we we're, we're an organisation ultimately that our ultimate aim is to not be in existence because we'd want the conversations around mental health to be normalised rather than it being so. And I think it is getting better. It is getting better, but I think it's still a quite a lot of stigma attached to it. I think there was be need for you, though, mate. Yeah. The sad truth of it, yeah. just with society and how life is at the moment and stress of every day, I think you're always going to be needed. And I think you're doing a great job with, well, when <laughs> with we, what when, you're doing. When, when you know? we set Plymouth up four years ago, I think we were club number 20 at the time. And then here we are, 130 clubs now. Even COVID hasn't stopped us opening up new clubs. So um, in a way, that's been a positive because before COVID we were all face to face then suddenly we had to all go online very quickly because um, obviously the change in, in landscape it's amazing but it's such a sad state of affairs that it's needed so much isn't it it's like you got two sides of it and if I'm so conflicted about it I'm like yeah it's, it's an amazing thing but then the root of that it's like it's never I don't feel like it's ever going to get so fixed ingra- it's so ingrained isn't it the- it's, it's like yeah it's like you know it's so many factors that none of us can ever impact and I think that's the bigger issue of it, isn't it? Yeah, but do you know what? I, 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 you know, I think about this sometimes, and I think if you look back through, you know, I, I'm sure like, you know, sort of men's mental health has always been there somewhere. 
Yeah. But it seems to be a lot more prevalent now. And I don't know if that's because of, of social media and, and how the, the world communicates. So we're yeah, aware 100%. of a lot more things because everything seems more, has more well, back in the now. Back in the 50s, you know, we were probably just worried about war and worried about those types of things. We don't really have time to worry about that. And it killed off a lot of men anyway those times we we lost a lot of men because they were at war they were doing or even throughout time you look at things like that it's probably the first time ever that we've had a, a, a 40 50 year gap with no especially in the western world with no massive wars yeah. where men haven't got to be men yeah. does that make sense yeah. like hey haven't got to be men we haven't got to go to war fight and kill each other on the basis of what someone else says or what someone else does and we're probably having to look at ourselves a little bit and trying to find our place again a little bit yeah but I, you think, know? I think also when you go back to those times you had things like national service yeah. which as, as you say wasn't always a good thing because a lot of guys got killed but it brought men together you had obviously a bit more of a pub culture maybe a little social bit later clubs on and pubs, social yeah. Club, yeah, yeah so that brought men together yeah. and you also had and again this is this is definitely not necessarily a good thing but the workplaces, a lot of workplaces were dominated by men. Mm. So you brought men together. And I think a lot of that's lost now, isn't it, these yeah. days? And that's maybe where on these man club But again, I, really I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. Like, I don't, I, uh, again, right or wrong, but I don't think it's a bad thing to have roles of in, in the workplace and roles outside of it. And I think yeah. at times we just need to embrace that a little bit more and, and speak about it and, and try and find our place again a little bit more because it is getting lost. There's no two fucking ways about yeah. it as you, you probably see it week in, week out. You know, men overworked, underpaid. They talk about, you know, men run the world, you know, rule the world. And really we don't because, you know, you might have the 1%, the one guy, the one the couple of people, but 99% of people of fucking bricklayers working in yeah. shit conditions, doing fucking loads of work for shit pay constantly, berated by their wives, trying to support their kids, trying to do all these fucking things that like, you know, at the end of the day, they're trying to do their best, but you know, the expectation of being a man is quite a lot these days yeah. because you've got to be, you've got to be good looking, you've got to be fit, you've got to be rich, you've got to be all these fucking things because everything that people see on social media and we're all trying to do that. Let's, let's make no mistake about it. We all try to be probably the best person we can be, but all of us will fall short. Do you know what I mean? And then you go on and then what, where do we kind of go from that point? You know, where do we go from that point? It's like, you know. Yeah, I guess what, what, what are the kind of themes? What do you tend to see like guys coming in? We've just obviously talked a little bit there about our, our perception and our view of maybe what some of the issues are for men. But, and, and I know you don't actually collect data on this, but just maybe from your own experience as a facilitator and speaking to your colleagues, like what 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 are the main issues for men? Yeah, I think the the the, the main couple of ones that I would I would look at is probably work and and relationships. Um, so so that's the reason I went along was was a relationship um, breakdown. Um, some guys will come along because they're it's linked to relationships, but, but sort of access to children. Um, so it is it is broad, but those are probably the two or three main main ones. Um, as as much as we are a mental health charity and sort of that that's that that's our aim most of the, i'd say it's probably a 50 50 split some guys come along because they've had something happen that's eventually going to become an issue with their mental health but it is more a um tr it's an event based thing that's happened rather than it being a, a slow burn or, or a long-standing issue so. yeah so you get some for example like their wife's left them yeah you know they can't see their kids yeah. and then they they've got nowhere to turn you know so it's having that early intervention to be able to talk about it then if they leave it six months then it will become more anxiety and depression related um or it could be a, a mental health crisis um but yeah so that those are probably the as i said we don't we don't collect real any any sort of data um from from guys but those are, if i was to say anything's more prevalent it would probably be those two things yeah and and do you collect like demographic data like age ethnicity that type of thing no um okay. again the only thing we collect um is a name at the start and and guys don't even have to give their real name they could give up give us a made-up name if they want to um we obviously will notice if we're getting quite a lot of younger guys or older guys but we have guys that we've had guys come to us who are sort of 18 19 early 20s to guys who are in the 70s and 80s um and, and that's the, the sort of wide range and some of the best conversations I've had without sort of going into the specifics but there's been guys in the room who are in their early 20s and they'll 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 say something and you'll see guys in their 50s and 60s go oh my god I wish I wish I had your knowledge when I was 18 or 19 I wish I had your um, 
perception of the world because it would have been massively different to me and you're in a bit better place now because you can spot this early on whereas i wish i'd had that 30 years ago yeah it's great that you've got that that wide range of ages there do you, do you see a more of a lean though is it is it more sort of middle-aged older men or is it because i think with suicide rates and we'll come on to this in a second um but we know that suicide is the biggest killer of men under 50 yeah. but i think 50 to 54 yeah. is the highest yeah. is the high where the highest rate of suicide is is it yeah. i didn't know that yeah. i think it's I about know. i think it's about 22 per 100,000. so it's pretty high yeah. um so yeah, back to the question. I think it, I think it. Yeah, we we we'll get guys. Majority are probably forties to fifties, um, but there is quite. I mean, the facilitator team, even the facilitator team is quite a, quite a range of, of age. I mean, I'm, I'm late thirties. There's guys in there, but I think I'm probably thinking there's guys in their twenties and stuff that are facilitators, and we notice that quite. We notice that someone would be a, a good fit quite quite quickly. Um, just the way they are with with the group and stuff like that but and we do say to them like this if you do want to help and become a facilitator don't think that that's then gonna have to change your role you can still use it as you want to um guys will come we'll we'll, we'll liaise at the weekend with like who's going to be at group monday and we can then plan plan the group um and guys will say basically i'm in a i'll be there monday but i'm not in a i've had a bad week i just want to be part of the group and that's perfectly fine there's no there's even though, even though they are facilitators in in name there's no there's no pressure on them to to sort of have that hat on every single week yeah that's good so going back to the statistics then so um obviously we know it's a it's a fucking huge problem suicide in men you know it's it's a scandal you know i mean like how high it is have you got any statistics that you can share in regard to the the prevalence and how much of an issue it is yeah so there's it's about four thousand men a year um which as part of our presentation we talk about it and, and you sort of see the people's reactions in the room when you talk to them about and you do the presentation it breaks down to 12 men a day or one man every two hours so while we're here now there'll probably be some man somewhere in the uk that takes their own life sadly um which is an absolutely awful statistic um so i'm under the age of 50 so statistically i'm more likely to die by my own hand than I am to die in a car accident or any any other way, which <laughs> is just is just ridiculous. Is that, to think is of that. that actually real? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah, mad, it's, it's isn't it? Statistically, the most that. most common for men under fifty that the what the biggest killer for them is is it's themselves. For themselves. Um, yeah, that's a fucking sad state, isn't it? It's it is, horrible. Mate. Yeah, yeah. Hell. I think I've got some stats here, but I think suicide is the second biggest cause of death in, in young males as well, between one and nineteen. So <laughs> even even teenage. Yeah teenagers and, and young kids it's it's super high and i think we talk about men's suicide rates because i think it's literally i think it's three times more prevalent yeah. than female yeah. suicide yeah this i is, think i think women i think the, the st- stats are women attempt suicide more than men but men are more final as that's yeah. what we've said before isn't it yeah we a lot a, of it is we had a doctor on yeah. and he, he talked about that didn't yeah. he, he a said there were men is, is a is a is a snap judgment it's not a it's not a slow build. It's sort of a, something will happen and they'll make that decision um, rather than sort of planning yeah, it. So I, had, um, I had a really close friend as his, his brother um, committed suicide and the impact on him and his family is just yeah. huge, you know, and um, I don't know. I just, I just don't think that people can ever really get over it, especially with the close, no. their close family. You know, it's, it's, you always try to and you always, as a friend, you always try and be there for them, but, I think, there's another such I, think huge... I think I read another statistic before that if someone dies by suicide, I think it impacts like 60 people around them. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like it's, it's the, 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 the sort of circle it hits is, is massive. It's not just like mum and dad or, or wife. It's it's a massive impact as well. I think it's because you question yourself. Yeah. If those pe- someone does do it, you think, oh, if I had spoke to him here or if I'd reached out there or would it, you know, would it change their decision? Ultimately, I don't think it would no. at times, no. but... You know, I think that's what you always ask yourself, isn't it? And even if you had spoke to them then, there's nothing to say that the next day they might not have done it then. Or done it six months' yeah, time, yeah. yeah. It's so it's, you, you'll always you'll always second guess. And I know I've spoken to, I've met Luke a couple of times and spoken to him and, and that was something that they had at the time that I think they saw him on the Sunday. I saw Andy on the Sunday and he was talking about, oh, I'm going into town this week to pay for a holiday. And then 24 hours later, he's he's, he's not there. So that again was a snap judgment of something had happened over the weekend, and and he he made that decision. I can't quite remember at the start of the podcast, but have you have you lost many people at your club or anyone um, that you that we, got close to and then sadly lost? We've lost two um, from Plymouth, uh, which which is too too many. Um, 
and again they were sort of they haven't they were a couple of years ago um, and they were both guys that had attended Andy's Man Club um, so it really hit the club quite quite hard um, but I know there's been got, there's been ones around the country as well um, and ultimately it's horrible to say but we I have to, and I think when it when it bef- when they first started the charity I think Luke's openly talked about it he said that every time someone died by suicide he was like what could I have done and he said but ultimately he's had to sort of train his mind over the years to say we'll help all these people but ultimately we can't help every single person it's not it's just not possible um we'd we'd, we'd be working we'd be doing even if we had Andy's man club every every area of the day we, we wouldn't be able to support every single person but we'll, we'll do what we can for as many as we can in the meantime yeah the way you said like there's two that you know did commit suicide but there could have been a hundred that did yeah. you know without Andy's man club so yeah you know it's yeah it's it's so sad man um Outside of outside of those facilitated sessions, um, so where you maybe identify someone who's maybe at high risk to themselves or somebody else, uh, you obviously have signposting and, and referral pathways that you mentioned. Um, is is there anything that you guys would typically do? Would you like follow up with a phone call or um, not really phone call? Some of the guys might um, sort of if if they if it's there, it's obviously their choice, not not something through through Andy's Man Club. Primarily, our our thing is that is the Monday night because um, again, we've had in the past where facilitators have have sort of felt obliged then to be sort of twenty four hour yeah. checking on, and obviously they've got their own their own stuff as well. Um, but some guys, if they, if they want to, they might swap numbers with person and then check in with them a couple of days later and just do that. But that's that's their obviously their own their own decision. And I've done it. I've I've checked in with people and said, "Oh, how you doing?" and um, and kept up with them, gone out for coffee with them, and that sort of stuff. But um, ultimately we have to sort of be mindful that we are volunteers so we we can't be there 20 we just can't be there 24 7 um but it's sort of giving them that opportunity where if they if they do talk they can then be better placed to sort of talk to people in, in their own lives as well yeah and as a facilitator do you i mean obviously you're involved with the groups as you say so you have the opportunity to talk out but if you're seeing um you know things and hearing things as a facilitator is there is there like who supports you um yeah, so we so we will debrief um, as a facilitator team at the end of every Monday. So there might be something that's gone on in another room um, that's not a it's not an emergency issue at the time. So obviously, if that was to happen, they'd sort of raise the alarm to say, "Oh, there's something going on." Um, but they might have a really tough group, and somebody might talk about something that really hits home. And even if it's not that day, that evening, they might think the next day, "Oh, it's really still still hit me." Um, so we'll debrief through the week and we'll sort of check in. So we use a bit of a traffic light system as a facilitator team where we'll sort of check in midweek and go, right, how's everybody doing? Green is good. Orange is sort of a, I'm okay, I'm, I'm getting by. And, and red's like, right, I need I need some support immediately. And we use that. We also use um, sort of a non-verbal thing on a Monday. So guys will come along to, to club the facilitators. And if someone comes along not wearing an Andy's Man Club t-shirt, we know that they just want to be part of the group. So it's not having to have that conversation about, oh, why you're not facilitating tonight. It's, um, but we'll do that during the week anyway. We'll sort of check in and we use that same traffic light system of a green. I'm I'm happy to run the group and yellow. I'm I'm I'll be there, but I just want to support the group. And um, so it's not not having to go into. I mean, if people do want to go into specifics, that's fine. But it's sort of having that easy way to say, I'm good or I'm, I'm I need a bit of support. And and like you, obviously the facilitators have, have, have their own stories as well. Are you able to share any of those stories where people have, or, or, have you know, any success stories or good good sort of yeah? Like good news so stories? one of one of the facilitators, um, it was actually his fourth anniversary of attending Andy's Man Club on Monday just gone, um, and we did a not long half not long after we'd started the Plymouth group, we did a a couple of um, promotional events at, at football matches. Uh, one was at Plymouth Parkway and one was at one was at Tavistock. So we went to the Plymouth Parkway game and and we stood there for two hours before the game and not one person came up to us for the whole for the whole two hours. We had guys walk past and drinking with their friends and and this facilitator came on the following Monday and he said, "I saw you at I saw you at Andy's uh, saw you at the Parkway game on Saturday and I didn't want to come over because I, I was with my friends, but um, if I didn't see you, I was going to take my own life yesterday." And then he came Fucking along hell. on the Monday and now four years later he's one of our most experienced facilitators. Yeah. Um, and he's quite open. He said, "That's what I would have done yesterday, um, if I hadn't seen your banner at the, at the at the ground on Saturday." I went home and looked it up, and then thought, 
I, this is something I need. Yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah, yeah fucking hell. And I say that all, all the facilitator team, bar, I'd say bar one, but even he, even he engaged in it to begin with. All the facilitator team are guys who walked through the door their first night, needed support, and then have come back or come along with a friend to support their friend and then stayed on and, and sort of got their own got their own demons to talk about. But um, yeah, there's a, every single one of the 20 of facilitators, I could say they come along and they're in this place and, and now they're in a much better place. And it's and that's the same UK wide. We've got guys who have got had children and like me had children and, and probably wouldn't have without, without Andy's Man Club. And it's just a, an organisation that even if I was to leave it in the future, I'd still have that affinity with and I'd, it would make me a, it's made me a much better person. Mm. Yeah. That's such a good fucking story, man. But yeah, it's fucking so sad at the same time, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I feel the same. I'm like, fuck yeah. it But you know, ultimately it, it's, you know, I think, most guys if they're honest at some point have, have been in low mood I mean not everybody has maybe had those sort of suicidal, suicidal thoughts but but yeah I think you know it's it's great work and it's ultimately why we're doing this podcast mm -hmm. as well to try and support where we can maybe from a slightly different angle um, but this is why we want to you know from from pretty much our first or second episode we, we have yeah. your website yeah. on our description if, if guys do want to chat because we appreciate some guys they, they just need that um, in addition to, to obviously the, the, what you guys do you said you signpost on occasion um, you've obviously got other charities like the Samaritans who provide sort of telephone services yeah. and one to one is, is there much other support out there for men um, maybe in cities where Andy's Man Club aren't available and they're yeah so them. I know I know down into Cornwall um, there's Man Down they do a similar thing to, to what we do I think their their nights vary so they do different nights of the week um, whereas obviously ours is a, is a Monday uh, we do a lot of work with like Devon Mind um, and other, other organisations um, and a lot of organisations there's one in Bristol I think it's Talk Club they, they, they're based in Bristol um, so those are the two or three that we, we know about but there's always stuff that we will see online and, and we'll share that with guys and um, guys will come to club and they'll share something with us that we we've not, we don't know about um, as I mentioned earlier the, the change to online with Covid was was in a way a positive because we then had the ability to go out to, to places in the UK where we didn't have clubs so the idea behind the growth of the clubs was trying to be a bit organic with that so we could, if we needed to, tomorrow open up 500 clubs around the UK. But what we don't want to do is do that and then in six months' time, only 200 of those clubs are still open because it's not worked and stuff. So every single club in Devon grew, grew off the back of the Newton Abbott Club. So we grew off the back of that. Exeter was opened up with guys from Newton Abbott. Torquay was opened up. Um, but with COVID, we were able to find then guys would go online um, and three or four of them might be based in Southampton. So they then would then have the ability to open up a club in Southampton. And um, the online has actually continued, which if, if they'd have been asked before COVID, they would have said, no, we'll never do an online option. It's, it has to be face to face, yeah. but it's continued because we've got guys who need the support and maybe live two hours from the nearest club. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I, I'm, a complete advocate for face-to-face -face yeah. stuff. Yeah. I think you should be around actual people, but something's better than nothing, isn't yeah. it? So and that's what the fact was with, with COVID. We within like two weeks, we had to do everything went to online, and it, it wasn't the same. It was it would never be the same, but it fe it met the need for the time we needed it to do. Um, and without that, we we probably still be sort of 30, 40 clubs, whereas now we're hundred and hundred and thirty clubs going. Yeah, that's great. And is is there anything? Um, that the government are kind of doing that you're aware of that's, that's supporting? I think there's a lot of work going on. Um, we don't really, I mean, I don't really keep an eye on much of the stuff going on. I know there's a lot of stuff been happening in the media, which is good. Um, recently, Emma Dale did a lot of work with, with Andy's Man Club um, and they actually used Andy's Man Club to help them write the scripts for the episodes, um, which was to do with Paddy and his his journey. And he actually went to a a fake Andy's Man Club in the episode. Um, Class. And they actually had the, the Andy's Man Club banner Brilliant. in the episode as well. Yeah, okay. So they'd done work with them for about six months. Um, and we actually had a couple of guys come along who said, I don't, I wouldn't have ever seen it, but I watch Emmerdale mm. and I saw it in Emmerdale. And that's an, an, an avenue that we probably would never have, would never have gone down. Um, so we, we're doing a lot of work. Um, and I think it's just around changing the perception. Um, so there's something that I hear quite a lot and it's something that I hear in TV programmes and films from years and years ago and then um, it's around the phrase committed suicide and around, what's that, around the phrase committed suicide yeah. um, and it's sort of ch even just changing that to be 
died by suicide because using the phrase committed is when it used to be a crime. Right, yeah. So it's just yeah, sort okay. of changing that mindset of... I've never heard of that before, yeah. by the way. Mm. I've always thought yeah. it was committed suicide. Mm. So we sort of... And at one of the videos Luke did early on, he used that phrase in the video. So even he's like, that's four years ago I used that phrase. Mm. And it's just sort of died by suicide or took their own life. So it's it's even just changing. And I, I still find myself now just about to say it. Yeah. And I have to sort of stop and die by suicide because it's sort of taking that bit of, I don't know what, I don't know why they, the way they worded it, it was making it seem like it's a, and it is an awful act, but making it seem like something that's criminal, which it obviously used to be yeah. um, years and years ago. Yeah. I always found that really bizarre, you know. So I just... <laughs> Like that, that whole concept yeah. of it being illegal. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's a sin as well, yeah. um, and it's I guess it's ways to try and stop people, people doing do it. it. But yeah. I don't know what they're going to do arrest you. <laughs> anyway, I think it's just the, the committed in suicide thing. I think more so people just ignorance to it, like me. Do you know what I mean? Never, never once in my life have I thought that would be the wrong way to say it. Mm. Or do you know what I mean? Like as times change, but I guess we're in a times now where and I think it's having it's having the conversation with people as well so we did this a while back and and someone was quite honest they, they did a talk and they said if you were to talk to someone about suicide about them have they have they thought about suicide that isn't gonna make them more likely to go and do it it's actually would bring them would bring that conversation up isn't isn't and some people I think sometimes get scared about having that conversation because they think if I or if I talk about it then I'm going to force that person to go and do it, and it's it's yeah. With 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 um with the, the kind of suicidal ideation and, and and thought, is there is there like I don't know a definition that you you kind of work to in regard to that? Like, is it is it someone actually in their head planning out how they would do it, or is it someone thinking you know what the world would be like if they weren't here? Like. Is is it just anything? Like- yeah, I think one of our one of our facilitators talks about this quite a lot, and he's quite quite philosophical. Um, somebody will talk in club about they've got so much on in their life, and and he'll be he'll just say to them a phrase that he uses is, "What's the best way to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It's like tackle one thing at a time. Don't think of it's this massive thing." And he he will often talk about his his struggles with that, and he'll say he he defines it as two different things the suicide ideation about the thoughts about suicide and that and then suicide activation so that is where i'm putting in place a plan of this is when i would do it this is what i would do this is where i would go so it's he said suicidal ideation is absolutely normal and having the thought is it even the, the the momentary thought of i could take my own so that is completely normal people have that thought you probably have that thought two or three times a week at certain times mm-hmm. He said, but it's more, if it starts to go into more the planning side, yeah. then it's more of a, that's more of a warning sign. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it, yeah. I think. And it's, um, I guess it's reassuring, I think, for a lot of people that some yeah. of those thoughts might be normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's say I, I was driving Bristol for, I'll just turn the, turn the wheel and drive over the bridge. Completely normal at that moment to think about that. Yeah. At the time it didn't feel normal, but looking back, it's like, well, actually what I was going through if I hadn't been thinking that, I'd think there's probably something more wrong if I if I hadn't thought of of taking my own life. But I'm glad, apps and and something that I had a I had a chat with Luke a while back, and and he he asked me a question, and I hadn't ever thought of it, and it it brought it to brought it straight to the front of my mind. He said, "Have you ever thought about what would have happened if you had done it? Like what impact that would have had?" And I was like, "Well, no." And then I did think I was like, oh, shit, like that. If I had done it, what would my mom? What would? And it's just, it was horrible to think. But I was like, actually, I've never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I think it's hard to at the time, though, isn't it? I imagine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah it's. You, you don't see any way out. Yeah, that's why they. That's why people do it. Well, it's because it's, it's it's the last, isn't it? I think for me, the thing that made me not do it was that the the worry that if I did say drive over the bridge. That I would end up paral- like I would end up paralysed. It, would, yeah. it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. It's weird you said that. Yeah. I was thinking that when you said yeah. that a minute ago. I thought, I thought, yeah, but you could be worse. You could just got paralysed, yeah. <laughs> like, and, yeah, and then what, you'd be even worse. I think then. that's what made me made me sort of not snap it, but that's made me sort of think actually. It's a weird one. I, I don't know if you know this, but is in the US is is suicide rates of men higher? I don't know if you ever thought. And the only reason I say it is access to guns. 
Yeah, yeah probably. And probably the only reason I'm asking that is because I, I know if I was to have <laughs> if I was to ever commit suicide, and it's not even I would, the only way I would ever do it is is via gun, just because it's done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't jump off a bridge. I wouldn't drown myself. I wouldn't do any of that because I wouldn't want to experience that. But I know with a gun, I'll be like, boom, see you later. You know? Yeah. I think it's probably quite prevalent, but I think the the difference over there is there's so many people. I think that's the, it's probably not, it's probably not statistically as high because there's so many people in America. Yeah, oh. it'd, be, it'd be interesting. I'd maybe yeah, I'll just have a little look, yeah. Because I think when you look at incidents, it's always per 100,000. So you'd, you'd have oh, like... you still get the numbers. Yeah. yeah. But it's, yeah, it's an interesting point because, um, you know, I start getting too I much into yeah. to, the, to the methods of it. But no. yeah, you're right. There's there's few more instant than a, than a gun is there. Yeah. I think it's bottle. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You don't have the bottle to do half the other stuff. Mm. <laughs> but I think... You know, and I don't want to get too deep in this because I'm not qualified, but, you know, there's obviously, I think for some guys from what I understand is they get to a point where they, they genuinely believe that they're so fucking worthless yeah. that the people around them, their loved ones would be actually yeah. better off if they weren't around. Yeah. And I think that's a really sad, that's a really sad mindset because as you say, that's just fucking really not true. It really yeah, is. No, it's, it's not true. It's often not, and, and Luke has said this in the past, it's often not the depression or or the, it's the lack of hope yeah. so it's in that moment that i've got no way out of this this is my only way out and actually and they said about and luke's um, and his mom said in the past that if if some if he'd spoken to someone they would have said actually there's this this and this mm. but obviously we, we weren't able to do that um yeah it's just a lack of hope it's and that's why we've, with men more than women women tend to plan it more men it tends to be an instantaneous like i'll go and get in my car and i'll drive and i'll drive off a cliff that's the it's it's not something they they sort of think about too much it's just an instant mm. instant reaction yeah okay so i think obviously the work that you guys do is massively important so where where do people find you if they want to if they want to reach out to andy's man club uh, so andy's man club has a main facebook page uh, which is followed by pretty much everybody um every single club as well has their own facebook page and social media um email address um info at andysmanclub.co.uk um, for us in Plymouth it's Plymouth at andysmanclub.co.uk that comes through directly to us us and the team um, which I'm sure will stay the same with our expansion uh, in the city which we'll, we'll cover off um, and then I say social media is great um, generally I'll see guys out and about and the first will read the first way I'll notice them is someone from club because they were wearing a hoodie or they were wearing a t-shirt um, so we, we sort of wear those out and about um, as much as possible, even just wearing a wristband, having that conversation starter. Um, but yeah, social media will be quite prevalent on. Um, I would say people can get in touch with us, in touch with us those ways. The, web, the website as well has a search facility on there. So if someone puts in their postcode, it will tell them where their nearest, their nearest Andy's Man Club is. Um, and that's open to anyone to look at that. So we'll often get asked when we do talks and presentations about, oh, well, you're a club for men does that mean that I can't come to you talk because I'm a woman and we say absolutely you are absolutely welcome to come the only time that we're men only is that seven to nine on a Monday we get often a lot of people will come to a lot of guys will come to us and they'll say I didn't know anything about you but my wife saw you at this event and she suggested I come along so having that referral from them is, is massive yeah, great. And you mentioned that there's an expansion in Plymouth locally. Yeah. So we currently meet at City College um, down in Devonport um, every Monday night. And we've just had yesterday, as we record, um, the go ahead to open our second club in, in the city up at Marjons. Um, so we'll have one in City College, one in Marjons, both running on Monday nights. Um, but obviously having the, the ability now to reach more men, more men in the city. Um, so 14th of August, that will be, that will be up and running. Uh, we'll have a couple of weeks there. And then we'll have a bank holiday break, and then we'll kick off back in September up to the uh, up to the Christmas period. Yeah, brilliant. And and what can people do to support the charity? I mean, do you is it is it is it funded on donations? How does that work? Yeah, so we get um, a lot of the funding is is through donations. Sad, sadly, a lot of the donations come from funerals of, of people that have died by suicide. Um, the charity gets grants from from the government as well, um, and we'll often do events where. We'll, we'll do fundraising and, and that all gets collected centrally. So we did an event a while back um, just over in Saltash. Um, so the money we raised goes centrally. And then if we need anything or any of the clubs need anything, that that's a, that's a central part of money. Um, so things like even tea, coffee, wristbands, biscuits, that sort of stuff is all all provided by them. We don't have to uh, we don't have to provide anything. Um, 
and similarly if people do want to do want to support us as well um we have to give a massive shout out to city college because they they offer their venue every monday free of charge um and and margins will be the same as well so all all the clubs around the uk um all have their venues free which which is fantastic from those organizations but allows us to then um and that's often the biggest barrier to opening a new club you'll have a low you'll have an area you'll have facilitators it's it's finding a venue and that'll be able to to, to host us on a on a monday evening um but that's yeah that's it really yeah that's great and and just just to finish up with if someone's watching right now it's a guy watching right now and he's he's obviously in a bad place um and he's he's on the fence about coming to talk to you guys in a club what would you say to them i would say that um ultimately they got nothing to lose by by giving it a try um we had a guy a few weeks ago come along and, and he said oh I'd, i've been on an r in and i thought i'd give it a go and we we said well it's at worst worst case you're gonna lose two hours of your life on a monday and 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 if you don't want to come back if it's not for you that's that's perfectly fine and even if it's not us um there are other, other organizations out there our guys will use it as part of a toolkit it's, we're, we're not the only support that they have Similarly, myself, I have life coaching and his man club friends, so I use it as as one of the things that that gets me, keeps me going. But um, just give it a try um, and find out more information. Even if it's not for that man, they might know someone in their life that might need it as well. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, mate. Yeah, thanks for sharing, mate. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Keep up the good work, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate thanks, it. Buddy.